Okay, we're continuing in Shmuel Aleph. We finished Perak Vav, but there's a very uh, important piece we have to look at. Uh, it's from the Musar Hanavim, so you can just pass this around. And he explains. Recall, the people of Beit Shemesh were punished very strongly when the Ark came. And um, the explanations we've given so far is that, well, they were busy working and they really didn't give it the proper respect that they should have given when the Aaron came. So let's take a look at the Musar Hanavim. It's, it's the right hand side of the page, below the line. Uh, the small print, the third line by the letter Yud. And it's, it's very interesting what he says over here. So a few interpretations, and one of them is very relevant since it is the morning before Tisha B'Av. He says, V'evshahot lahosi v'lomar, we can add and say, D'lakach ner gu'az ha-toivim shebi Yisrael. Why was it that the good ones died? Because according to one of the opinions in the Gemara Sukkah, remember there, there was a difficulty, it says 70 died and then 50,000 died. So one person says it was 70, and each one was comparable to 50,000 Jews. And uh, the other opinion says that indeed 50,000 died, but each one was comparable to the 70 people on the Sanhedrin. So according to either opinion, they were very significant people. They weren't like the low lives of the Jewish people. So why is it that such good people died? So he's explaining, There was a great prosecution against the Jewish people in heaven. Because the Plishtim we saw, according to many opinions, they showed great honor for the Ark. Because when the Jews first brought the Ark into battle, what was the reaction of the police team? Nizda'azu. They were shaking and trembling. From where they said, Oi, miyat silenu miyadu elokima dirimo ele. Who will save us from these uh, powerful, noble kings, gods? Ele hemo elokim. These are the gods that destroyed Mitzrayim. So they had a tremendous reverence for this ark. And they returned it to the Jews. They made sure to give it great honor with all the golden gifts that went with it. So the police didn't know how to show so much respect for the ark. But the Jews themselves did not give the Ark the same amount of honor. At the time that the Plishim were mentioning the miracles of Egypt, they, they forgot about it. They weren't thinking about it. And from this is aroused a great calamity the great prosecution against the Jews. And that brought the great plague that happened to them. So the first interpretation is saying, and this is a golden rule, that Hashem always, whatever the non-Jews show a greater uh, religious fervor. So God looks at the Jews and says, how are you matching it? And if we don't, that's a terrible thing. We've had this many times in the past. Uh, when Haman showed great Messiris Nefesh for his belief to destroy the Jews, right? There wasn't an equal and matching Messiris Nefesh on the part of the Jews to stay fast with their religion. So we have to remember that. So if the, and, and you see the contradistinction by the fact that the Plishim were so in awe of that Ark. And then the Ark comes back to the Jews. And the Jews are busy working. They're not even taking time to stop from their work and uh, it's a very serious indictment against the Jewish people you know today it's, it's no different 
like there, there are serious, you know, the, 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 the wealthy Christian world is prepared to spend millions of dollars to proselytize one Jew. And how much millions are Jews prepared to, to spend to save one Jew? So that's a big, uh, that's a big criticism against the Jewish people. If, the, if, a, if a non-Jew has reverence, even though he's only going to church once a week for an hour, but if they show great respect in their shul, what kind of an indictment is the Jewish people when they talk in shuls? which is supposed to be a, a miniature uh, replica of what uh, the Holy Temple is all about. So that's, that's a great indictment. And Hashem looks and says, how do you compare? How's your, how's your honor for your God and for your religious artifacts as uh, does it compare to what goes on in the non-Jewish world? So that's the first interpretation. Second interpretation, vote Ev Shalomar. Another thing we could say, on the lower right hand say it, sign on this Musa Hanavim page 314 another reason why the Jews were punished and this is what's relevant now for, for, for tonight the Gemara in Tainus says the following whoever mourns over your Shalayim will merit and will see its joy Whatever does not mourn over Jerusalem will not see its joy. Again, it's very obvious why. If, if you're not mourning for this, if you're not mourning for Shalim, then there's obviously, you feel there's nothing wrong with the way things are right now. And if nothing's wrong with the way things are right now, so why should God change it for you? If you'd be mourning for it, Hashem would bring it back to you. Hashem gives you exactly what you want. So, if people don't mourn for your Shalim, Hashem doesn't give it back to them. Now, you know, we're, not, we're not talking just about the piece of property of Shalim. We're talking about the, the temple coming back the way it should be. Right? So, that, that's a golden rule. That's why we sit Tisha B'Av, to try to not forget that. Chenon Rishmos Rabbah says the same thing in Medrash Rabbah. It says, Lev Yodea Moras Navsho. It says in Mishle, the Pasuk, Lev Yodea Moras Navsho, the heart knows the bitterness of its soul. And in its joy, a stranger will not be mixed in, will not gather in. But it explains what that means. Lev Yodea Moras Navsho, what does it mean? When, it's, when King Solomon said, the heart knows the bitterness of its soul. This is referring to Jewish people who are in Egypt during the terrible servitude. The Kivin Shabbat says, so once it was time for the Jews to leave. Because their Alema Kaddish Baruch Hu Pesach, and Hashem decreed to make a Korban Pesach before they were going to leave. The Mitzrim wanted to eat with the Jews, want to be part of the Pesach Seder. No way. And what one of the rules of the Korban Pesach it says, Call Ben Yochobo. No stranger, no non Jew can take part in the Korban Pesach. Why? Because in the second half of the Pasuk, because in his joy, no strangers shall be mixed in. So what are we saying over here? Was, and therefore, the Jew, non-Jew is not allowed to be at the Pesach Seder. And for that reason, you know, barring exceptions, barring exceptions, non-Jews should not be at Pesach Seders today. Okay, if there's shown bias issues, cure issues, I'm not going to go into the details, but in the purest sense, you know, you don't invite your, uh, your social um, contacts who are non-Jewish to come and visit you at your Seder. This is the same idea. This one is going to explain. Well, the Jews are in a very difficult servitude. There wasn't one Egyptian who came to worry and concern himself about the Jewish suffering and said, okay, I feel terrible for you. I'll try to help you out. I'll, I'll go against the establishment. We'll have some pro-Jewish rallies for their rights. There wasn't one. 
Rakish Gias Manakaula, but when it came time for the redemption and the Egyptians knew that the game was over, then Osbaldi started to sing Chasa. Then they said, Okay, we want to come to your Seder. Chemra Kadesh Barchus Hashem says, Shemishlo Hisabal Imoim Biyachat Beis Sarasun, whoever wasn't mourning for them in the times of their suffering, he have some Lakachas Chelik to sing Chasa. They can't take a part in their joy right now. <coughs> And that and that's the same idea with the uh, the base of English. The chaim bezeh chato yisrael acharei churban shilo. This was the sin that the Jewish people did after Shilo was destroyed. So he sabla la churban. They didn't mourn for the destruction. They didn't mourn for the captivity of the Aaron. Valzeshinishbar and, and that which the ark was taken into captivity. We don't see anywhere in the Pesukim there was a great wave of mourning that happened for the Jews. Now you might, say, you might explain why if you want to rationalize it for them. They said, because after all, how many of them were coming to Shiloh when it was up? Elkanah went, the diehards went, but the majority of people did not go because of the uh, lower spiritual level of leadership of Chafmi and Pincha. So that might be their excuse that they gave. So Hashem said, okay, but I'm going to take it away. Now it's gone. You'd figure once it's gone, you know, once you lose something, then you would appreciate it more and mourn for it. But they didn't mourn for it. That's any kind of mourning. Come on, Shomer Breshis Rabbah, like it says in Breshis Rabbah, Amar Kodesh Baruch Hu. If somebody's rooster got lost, they'd be knocking door to door to find their lost rooster. And the ark is sitting in the fields of the police for seven months and nobody's even taking notice of it. They should have figured, let's make a counterattack. Let's let's send a delegation. Let's let's do something. Nothing. They didn't mourn for it the entire time. Therefore, when the simcha came, when it came back to its place, now the Jews wanted to take part in the simcha. Hashem showed you're not worthy to be part of this simcha. And a great plague came to them. And so, as you can see that on many levels, on many levels, um, so um, you, you could say that since they didn't miss it so much, so, you no, know, they weren't necessarily that happy. They were taking part in the happiness, but not, to what extent? Yeah, like that. make a smile. Oh, that's nice. It's nice. It's back. So I'll I'll still keep working. So it's like you're not even you don't even you don't even sense that it's that the joy that's there. And that's you know, Rav Cook's famous vort. Uh, Rav Cook says, well, how could the Gemara say that he who doesn't mourn for Yishalayim won't merit to see its joy? So he says, but it's not true. We see that Yerushalayim is built up now. Eretz Yisrael is built up, and uh, and and they've seen it. So the answer is, they don't see it as being a happy occasion. In other words, you know, the secular secular uh, Jews do not necessarily feel that having Yerushalayim is a reason to be happy, because they're very happy to give it away. They were happy to give it away. So, in other words, they're not seeing that, that he's saying it, they, they, it's being built. The building they've seen, it doesn't say, why doesn't it say that they will merit to see it's being built? Right? So he's saying, because they merit to see it's built, but they're not meriting to see the joy. They're not having any joy from this. So, the same thing, you know, if, if, if the Jews didn't mind so much when it was gone, when it was up and it was taken, so they're not going to be that happy when it comes back. And, and, and that, you know, ties into the first shot that they didn't show the same respect for it. Why would you not show respect for the Holy Aaron? Because it didn't, didn't make a difference in your life. Life went on without it very nicely. The main thing is, is my farm working? Is everything fine? And this is really the, the real issue why, you know, we're having a lot of difficulty mourning for the temple. A lot of difficulty because 
because unfortunately for most even for most practicing religious Jews it doesn't mean that much to them because I've got my nice comfortable home I've got my air conditioning I've got my cottage up north what could I be missing in life I even have a minion where we don't talk in Dominic what could I be missing I'm even learning tomorrow I'm, I'm doing mitzvahs I'm all this but uh, we're not understanding the tragic life that we are living without a base of Migdash, without a temple, without being able to feel this closeness to Hashem in a serious way. It doesn't bother us very much. The fact that it doesn't bother us is that life goes on and we're very happy. And it's, it's pretty hard to just get psyched up once a year to even be uh, disturbed with Tisha B'Av interfering with our calendar. But, you know, we're good Jews, so we do it. But that real sense of loss, it's, it's very hard. And, you know, not, not, not blaming people, we're just stating the case because it's too good here. It is way too good. And our great-grandparents didn't have to have trouble mourning for, for the temple because the Goyim hated them and they knew it. They couldn't get good jobs. And they knew they were in Golis. And this is the great, the great Khurban of America that's coming to the Jewish people is because we don't believe we're in Golis. We really think it's a lot better here. Mashiach could never be any better than the way we have it. <coughs> okay, there's a few Muslims who don't like us. And, you know, and okay, 99% of the Middle East wants to destroy Israel, but we have a strong army so we don't have to worry. And therefore, we don't, we don't sense any because, you know, we, thank God we haven't had any massacres lately. So Hashem is kind of saying, well, can, can you see it on your own, perhaps? So if not, not. So that, that's the tragedy. And what happens is that the best go. 50,000 people, each one compared to one of the, of the whole 70 Sanhedrin. Whew. I mean, you know, in, in other words, God wasn't expecting the farmer to be upset about it, but where was the Sanhedrin? Well, you, don't, you don't write anything that Sanhedrin went around and was... Uh, cajoling the people to mourn and they were unsuccessful in their, in their attempts this is all, it's all the pre-Shmuel era Shmuel is about to emerge but until Shmuel emerged you know it just wasn't there it just wasn't there and that's, and that's you know ultimately that's when great tragedy comes so even when the art comes back there was great great tragedy okay and now he elaborates one more point sure I should have said this tonight sure and, and the main thing it appears to say so the main thing we could say is when the ark was taken into captivity and Shila was destroyed many people thought that the gods of the Plishtim defeated the gods of Israel and they went back to the good old Avodah Zarah days so even then it was fitting for them to have been punished they should have been punished right away but Hashem pushed off, pushed off the punishment until the iron was put back in its place so that the Jews should see with their own eyes how far off they went in their sinning to HaKadosh Baruch then he gave them the punishment they deserved only when he brings the ark back and he says what do you you think the Plishti God is stronger than our God and you're serving their gods you're going to see what, 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 what I can do to their gods believe me if the, can you imagine can you imagine the Plishti would give back that ark believe me that was the last thing in the world they wanted to do the last thing they wanted to do and now they're watching and seeing the five governors watching from a distance that the, that the calves are bringing the ark back people should have been repenting en masse right and, and, and Hashem was showing them everything he says now it's too late right? can, you imagine, can you imagine what would happen if, if, all the, if, the, if the Arab League would all get together and you know, jointly make a statement that we are not going to bother the Jews anymore and that they are entitled for their, the right to existence and we are going to give them you know, 50 billion dollars of reparations for all the suffering we gave to them I wonder how many Jews would come back to Hashem from that. Right? So then so then you get it. You get it. Bev Shalom, we could say, for all these reasons, Amr Chazal of Sanhedrin, the Gemara Sanhedrin says, Shonolivrait Michevle Shal Mashiach. 
Now I can understand why the rabbis said that we got to be very afraid when the birth pangs of Mashiach come. What do they say in the Gemara? There were many of the rabbis who said, it should come, but I shouldn't be around to see it. Why is there so much fear? Because only then will the great uh, justice be served against the Jews. Because we didn't, we didn't take part in the pain of the Jewish people properly. And because we've given up hope from the redemption. Because the foreign gods of the world are much stronger than HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's what we feel. And that'll be the same law that will happen to the people of Bet Shemesh. So that's, now you're wondering why there's so much tragedy happening to the Jewish people. Because we're coming to, we're coming to the Chevli Mashiach. It's, it's almost like the Ark was brought back, wasn't it? In 1948, in 1967. The Ark wasn't brought back. You didn't see how powerful the God of the Jews is? So, like, so what happened? So what happened? What happened is, that's nice, but uh, life's been pretty good without it. So that's why, you, you know, you wonder why, why so many tragedies are happening to such good people. Because it's all part of the Chavli Mashiach. Part of the Chavli Mashiach. And when Hashem said, where were, we, where were you for me uh, all the other times? Rabbi, six oh. million Jews, was, life was good for the Jews before Israel. That, that's immaterial. That's it's immaterial. immaterial. It's immaterial. It's the same thing at 50,000 Jews dying. No, no that, that's, that's like the, it's like the Oren was taken away. They lost the battle. It's not compared to that. It's compared to the tens of thousands of Jews who lost the battle to the Plishtim. Hashem gives you a zetz. Okay, now. Now it's coming back. Now it's coming back. So what are you doing now that it's coming back? Now, now the Ark is coming back. You got, you got back there, it's just wrong. After 1900 years, you got back there, it's just wrong. So what's your reaction? It's back now. Everything you wanted. So, so, but you, you see, then, then it would appear even before. Listen, there was a chance to come back. It's a chance to come back in the 1900s. There were Jews who did go to Eretz Yisrael, and it was very hard. It's, a, it's the same thing. It just repeats itself. In the late 18, in the 1800s, the students of the Vilna gone. They went to Eretz Yisrael. They went to Eretz Yisrael. They were there. Was it hard? Very hard. Is it nearly impossible? Nearly impossible. But not one Jew was in Eretz Yisrael died in the Holocaust. Not one. Not one. Even when, uh, what's his name? Who was his general? Hitler's general? What's his name? Rommel. Rommel. Even if Rommel will say, I'm having breakfast in uh, Cairo and I'll have dinner in Jerusalem and there was no reason to think otherwise. Right? Miraculously, he loses in El Almey. Miraculously. This was one there were no miracles happening yet. So, and and uh, not one Jew in Eretz Yisrael got touched. Not a one. Not a one. Just a question. On so, so now, so, the, so there was a time to go. Whatever. You know, we're, not, we're, not, we're not judging people. We're just stating facts. That's all. You know, just stating facts. And everyone said, well, life is a lot better in Europe. It's a lot better in Europe. So it seems okay. It's a lot better in Europe. Berlin is Jerusalem. Okay. Berlin is Jerusalem. We'll see. We'll see. So now you have a chance to go back there. It's a stroll. I mean, there, really, you could have gone back. It was. There was a bit. It wasn't easy. And and who did Hashem expect to come back? Did Hashem expect um, um, assimilated Germans to go back there? It's a stroll. Or religious uh, Hasidim. And, and believe me, life was not that much of a picnic in Poland. It wasn't that much of a picnic. But uh, you know what? People, as I said in showers, people can get used to any terrible situation and think it's okay. You're getting used to be calling a, a jid, and you're being used to always being hated by the non-Jews. Get used to it because you know what? Creature comforts prevail. But the Vilna Gon students, they were most nefesh. They were most nefesh, and. Uh, Certain Hasidic sects were most nefesh, and believe it or not, the Hasidim and Snag they made some shalom and Eretz Yisrael much quicker than the than the others did in, in Europe, because they knew they had to. 
to survive, they have to get along with each other. And, and by and large, the great rift between the Hasidim and the Misnagim and Eretz Yisrael stopped a lot sooner. And after the Holocaust, Hashem finished the other rift. You know, you know, it's it's incredible. After the Holocaust, how how people, my own parents, Aleph and Shalom, would never have gotten married to each other, never before the Holocaust. My mother came from Gerach Hasidim. My father came from the, from Misnagdim. Would never have married each other. Never. And Hashem finished that real fast. He finished it really fast. All of a sudden, you can get along. Right. So those ones there, sure, they got along a little faster because they realized. So there was a chance. There was a chance. There was a chance. The ark was coming back. Who really felt it was important? They saw the simcha. They saw the simcha. Those who didn't, didn't. Aren't we all even more so guilty today? So you got it. Easier to go, all of us. So that's why Hashem makes it even more comfortable to be here, to make it harder to leave. <laughs> it's not now. You don't have non-Jews hating you so overtly, right? It's also much easier to go. Maybe it's easier, and it's not. It's it's. Here's the point. It, it, on every era, the 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 difference of lifestyle is is going to be, for the person that situation, very stark. You know, you're living. Every, most people are living in very, very comfortable homes. Even the even the most average person is living in the most comfortable home. He's going to live in an area three times as big as the nicest place he'll find in Eretz Yisrael. You know, your buying power is going to be tremendously knocked down. You're not going to be having stakes whenever you want them. You're going to have to lower your scale of living dramatically. Now, dramatically, so you know, and nobody would dare live like a person like that here. If if we would tell everybody to move into an apartment, they would say, "You crazy? For me to live like that? I couldn't live that way." It's an apartment with central air conditioning, though, and you know, but we just can't. We just can't get ourselves to do it because we don't feel we don't feel it's that important. So again, that's uh, that's the issue. So the uh, same thing will happen. So don't have any illusions. <laughs> Don't have any illusions. The same thing is going to happen again. That's the question is when, and, and, uh, but uh, we're, we're not sensing it because why aren't the rabbis telling us? Because uh, nobody Because li- nobody listens to the rabbis. What, but they're not even trying. You know, you know, it comes That's to the point. The more you talk, the more people don't listen. And the more they lose respect for the rabbis, and that happens all the time. I've I've been told in no uncertain terms on many issues to stop pushing the issues because people are leaving the shul and that's all so I don't talk about it let everybody be happy and we'll go happily go to the gas chambers isn't that the same problem hearing, that happened no. with the Sanhedrin you're not hearing the shul in, in, in Chutzla Arts you're not hearing I mean, look, look. even once so go speak to them what can I tell you I, I, what can I tell you you, you, you know you can almost say that New York the whole area has become like Berlin was and to Jews, that that's really where you need to be. Borough Park, or you know, five. Okay, there's a lot of issues. I'm not. I'm not going to get involved. I'm just teaching you Navi. <laughs> I'm just teaching you Navi. I'm not such a big. I'm not such a big rep. Listen, I I guess they feel that if people, well, you, let's look at it on the other hand. Let, let's be fair. Uh, let's look at some of the people who have made Aliyah, and I'm not going to mention any names. There are people who have who who were who grew a lot in their spirituality while they were um, in North American communities, and they've made Aliyah and they've gone down in their religiosity in Eretz Yisrael. And if you're going down, you don't go down in Eretz Yisrael because then that's a much bigger chutzpah than staying in chutzlars. If you were if you were covering your hair and wearing dresses while you were in Thornhill, and then now you're in Eretz Yisrael. You're not covering your hair anymore, and you're wearing pants. You know, keep it keep it in Thornhill. Don't take it there. If you if you want to screw up, you don't screw up in God's palace. So you know, I guess the rabbis feel that they would screw up badly. So you know, those are judgment calls. Only one day will Hashem say who is correct. You, know, you have to be careful. You want to go there, it's just roll. It's not just cutting down on your lifestyle, it's cutting down on everything and, and really being a person. This is where the Bilvavi has to, the pavement, uh, where the rubber has to hit the road. You have to really live with HaKadosh Baruch Hu in Eretz If you don't, Hashem gets much more upset. 
You know, you, you sleep in a misdavening here, it's one thing. You sleep in a misdavening over there, it's another thing. And you can't just say, well, now at least I'm living there, so Hashem's happy with me. It means a dramatic lifestyle shift. And I've probably imagined the Gedolim are feeling Jews would not make, they would, if they would move, they'd move with all their luxurious lifestyle and want that to be in Eretz Yisrael. Eretz Yisrael was never meant to be that way. That's what Gemara says. Three things are acquired with suffering. Torah, Olam Haba and Eretz Yisrael. It's acquired with suffering. It doesn't come with luxury and conveniences. It's not. It's a contradiction. Spirituality is a focus on the spiritual, not on the physical. You can't, you can't be focused on the physical and be a spiritual person. You can't. It's just not possible. So that's why in Eretz Yisrael the lifestyle is less because that's how you can become a spiritual person. And even, even the blessings that Hashem provides us as I mentioned to somebody last week nowhere in the Shema does it says if you listen to Hashem is Hashem going to make you rich it says what you, uh, Nasati, I'll bring the rain at its times you will, you will, ha- you will uh, harvest your grains you will have what to eat it doesn't say you're going to be rich no one in there is supposed to be rich as we said last week in the weekday classes being rich is not a blessing it is not a blessing it is a curse Right? It's a curse. The having what you need is a blessing. Having what you need is a blessing. If you have a home, it's a blessing. If if you don't have a cottage, doesn't mean that you're or if you do have a cottage, doesn't mean you're being blessed. Okay. Doesn't mean doesn't mean you're being blessed. Usually usually one home should be enough for a person. But no, you have to have two homes, three homes, four homes. It's like how many homes do you need already? It's, so that, that's the problem. That's the problem. So, so I guess the great rabbis are figuring that you know we're going to send them all there. First of all, they're not going to listen to us. Number one, and 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 those who will listen to us are going to expect Yerushalayim to be like Borough Park, and it's not. It's going to be a big come down, and 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 could very well be many Jews will not serve Hashem properly. So let let's look at the three possible scenarios, and what's the worst scenario? What's the best scenario? And what's maybe what we'll call possibly the pragmatic scenario. The best scenario, obviously, is you should live in Eretz Yisrael and be a, a thorough Shomer Torah mitzvah, happy to live with little. That's the highest level. How many people can do that? On the other hand, you have people who can live in Chutz Laaretz, who are Shomer Torah mitzvahs, and they're happy with their Avodah Hashem. They're, they're, they're into what they're doing. Okay, they're a bit, a bit uh, excessive on the physical pleasures of life, but still they're pretty much uh, good people. And then the third level of it, what if they go to, and, and let's say and the guy's in Chosos and he's learning and he's into his learning and his family is very from and they're very distinct from the non-Jews. You know, what would be the third level? They're in Eretz Yisrael, but their religiosity is, is, is failing greatly. So what's better? Well, what's the worst scenario? The last one is the worst scenario. To live in Eretz Yisrael and to decline in your religiosity is much worse than staying in Chutzar or something on a higher level of your religiosity. Is that better than living in Eretz Yisrael and staying on that high level? No. So everything's relative. So rabbis have to make judgment calls. Hashem should protect them that they're making the right decisions. Hashem should protect them that they're not making any mistakes. So if, if you want to, if you want to, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's many rabbis who will criticize that position, many rabbis who will defend that position, and and some of them are trying to like ease communities into Eretz Yisrael. You find some of the Hasidic communities, the rabbis have gone to Eretz Yisrael, right? Bells, right? The rabbis gone to Eretz Yisrael, the beautiful, beautiful community there. Maybe slowly, slowly, their, their plan is to slowly move everybody there. But it's got to be a very slow transition. You can't do it so quickly. Well, then we do it west now. And then there was a rabbi in New York who did that. You know, you know they, they all talk about the rabbi who did it in New York. They, did, they say he took his whole community. From what I hear, how much of the whole community? Maybe four or five families went with him. Mm-hmm. Now, he built up a beautiful thing there. Yeah. I mean, he took his whole shul. The guy's whole shul. He told the whole shul. Nobody went with him except for a couple of diehards. And, and, and the shul that still he left behind is the same shul he left behind if not worse I don't know I don't know but he, Hashem blessed him that he had, got a new community he got a new community Baruch Hashem so it's, uh, these are good things to think about Tishabov. but yeah, you have to also be practical and pragmatic 
and it's it's uh, again if they like I say the only hetter I have to be here is I'm doing kiruv here. That's all. Like it's God saying, what am I doing? I say, listen, Hashem, we're having we're having uh, Friday night, uh, Friday uh, late afternoon parties. Secular Jews are, are are getting a little connection to Yiddishkeit, and hopefully we're going to save some. What, what takes priority? We know the pikuach nefesh is doch every mitzvah. Saving a life pushes away every mitzvah in the Torah. Oh yeah, we all have our... Uh, no, our, not an excuse. We, not, we have our... There's priorities. There's priorities. The pri- if you know there's a Jew dying in Chutz Oretz, you have to leave Eretz Yisrael and save his life. So who is going to save the lives of the Jews whose souls are dying in Thornhill? Who's going to save their lives? There are Jews who think life is wonderful being secular. They're dead. Spiritually, they're dead. And if nobody intervenes, they will remain dead. If you intervene in their life, then, uh, then you'll help them. So, so obviously, you just can't say the rabbi. The rabbi does it as a team with his community. Right? And so people have to be involved in trying to help other Jews. And that, that's, what the, that's what's in our Constitution. Without that, uh, without that clause in the Constitution, we shouldn't be around. That's... But people, many people will say, listen, we're from now. Why do we have to bother anybody else? Why have another? Now, we're go- now, now we look to find the most convenient minion for ourselves. That's our next step of spiritual growth. We don't want to be reminded of how non-religious we were and that we should dirty ourselves with them. Although other people had to dirty themselves for us. We now have a very religious shtibel we go to and we feel very religious now. You know, and, and, and they forget why they were allowed to not uh, go to Eretz Yisrael. So that's, that's a problem. And if the rabbi talks about it, they don't like it. There's a lot of other rabbis, Orthodox from rabbis, will tell you anything you want to hear now. Make you feel very happy because they want to keep their, uh, their institutions alive. So that's, and then what, what are you going to do? It's a tough situation. Hashem should help us. Hashem should help us. We need, we need a refuah shalema. We need a big refuah shalema. It's what to cry about tonight. It's what to cry about. Yeah. Talk about the birth pangs of Mashiach. So we say that, oh yeah, that's now we're in the birth pangs and all the suffering. But, but like when I read that Rumble book I showed you, so like 850 years ago, they said the same thing. So and so beat this person in battle and that battle and now we're suffering. So this is the birth pangs of Mashiach. So we're the same thing forever. So how do you know this is the, the true birth pain? We don't, we don't know. We don't know. You know. You're right. You're right. How do we know? We don't. But one thing we know for sure is, one, one thing for sure, it, it, you have a good reason to cry tonight? Yeah, we do. Okay. And most people won't. Most people don't even know about it. Most, no, I'm talking about the from ones. I'm talking to people who are going to be in shul tonight. People who are going to be in shul today tomorrow, how am I going to really cry? How, how many of us are doing it because it's a religious obligation? You know, let, let, let me try to um, reframe it. God forbid uh, somebody's beloved parent died, would they need to be legislated to mourn for it? Well, now this is what you have to do to mourn for your parent. Okay, now you will cry. When we give you the signal, you will cry. When we say the Kalmole, now that is the time to cry. Uh, we're going to tell you that you have to sit in the house for seven. You don't have to tell anybody this. It's natural. It's natural. Because you loved your parents, so you're going to cry for them. You don't have to legislate them. And Nachan to the person who wouldn't cry for his parents, it means he didn't really care about them. All right. So now we have to legislate. The rabbis had to legislate us. To, to sit Shiva once a day, to legislate it that we should feel bad, because if they wouldn't, we certainly wouldn't feel bad. So we feel like we're forced to go into Shul, have to go to Shul. How's it going to look if I don't go to Shul? You know, so I lost the day from work, it's a very big inconvenience. You know, so that it's like no, nobody feels anything. It, it can imagine it'd be so much worse if we didn't even force, if the rabbis didn't force you to keep it. At least they're forcing you to keep it. So then maybe you'll at least remember this. There's something. So Hashem does other things. Hashem does other things. It never, he has to take away people we love. But you know, and then you remember them. You kind of, I wish Mashiach would come. Maybe I'd, I'd see my parents again. That's I'm not saying people shouldn't cry, but it's like if, you, know, you, you cry less on the... F- I don't mean, thank God I don't know from this. You cry less as the... F- so, someone doesn't cry as much on the 50th of your side of a parent. 
Okay, so 2,000 years later, it's, it's hard. It's hard to relate to, to yeah, the yeah, same level of intensity as it was the first year at the, at the time. Yeah, okay. Well, you can't we should cry because we, we can't cry. Yeah. No, I'm saying, so okay, a parent is one thing, and, and, and basically this is another. Again, it's a, the basic mix is another. It's, it's also, you know, what I'm, I'm saying, that, you know, we didn't live at the time. I'm not, I'm not an excuse. I'm just that, saying. That, 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 so that's what I was saying on Shabbos. We don't have to mourn for then. We're mourning for now. We're mourning for now. That that it, that we we look what it's written in the Torah, and we and we have so much t- difficulty feeling the way Hashem wants you to feel in the Torah. Love of Hashem. How many people really love Hashem? Man, love him. How many people fear Hashem? I mean, it's, it's a mitzvah today we're not doing. If they had a base of Mikdash, it was a little easier to feel, a lot easier to feel the love of Hashem, the fear of Hashem, the connectivity, the fact, the fact that we don't enjoy so many of our mitzvahs because we don't have a base of Mikdash. The fact that we're going through all this uh, challenge and we always feel we're giving up something. So it's because we don't have a base of Mikdash. That, that means right now, you know, if a person, uh, if a person, uh, you know, is, is forever poor and needing to make money, you know, they, they're always feeling bad. Feeling bad. How come I don't have this? How come I don't have that? You're feeling bad. So Kodesh Baruch Hu wants us to feel that same way about the base of Mikdash. So like either way, unfortunately, it, it spells not a good scenario. In other words, if, if this is not the Chavli Mashiach, so it's a rotten state of Golos. You should cry over that, no? If it is the Chevel Mashiach, it's going to be terrible because Hashem says, where were you when I wanted you to cry for me? It doesn't bode well. So that's what the rabbis say. Okay, Tisha B'Av really got to get into it and really, you know, totally start thinking about why. And that's the job. You hope that Hashem helps the rabbi. He, he uh, arouses people's hearts a little bit. And it's hard. Our hearts are getting very colder. Very yeah, cold. That's up to on um, Wednesday. Everybody's like, wow, great, we're happy. Everybody's, you know, I mean, life has to go on. You have to be hopeful. Yeah. You have to go on, but I mean, like, it's like, you know, I'll admit, I know. I'll shave like at 130. Right? Okay. I mean, listen, you, you shave after the shloshim for a parent as well. Life goes on, but, but you... But the music <laughs> stuff, everybody's up. The different... For, you the put the music on... The difference is, life goes on, but what, what's the whole point of a shiva? Life goes on, but you have to be changed. Well, like it me, it's almost like it's a celebration day. It's almost like that, the, the way... You know, fifteenth. Of first of all, oh, first of all, you're not right supposed right? to. You're not supposed to celebrate till two bav. Fifteenth of all. Till the fifteenth of all. Okay, but okay. at least it should be another week. It should be another week. So there'll be no. All right. Yeah, you know, you know, I, I mean, mean, you should. Ready? No, yeah, listen. The person who's shaving after shloshim, I don't think is celebrating. You know, when you're able to shave for your parent after shloshim. He's saying, I wish I, I, I wouldn't have to. Heart. You mourn for the yeah. year. You mourn for the year. <laughs> Every day, you know. But you know, Chazal did feel we should. Chazal said there are things you have to do every day to show the morning. Again, how many homes you go into that there's a whole square amo that is not painted or plastered by the front door? How many? Is that such a big sacrifice? How many people do that? Religious people, they have all these ways to cut corners. No, I have a beautiful picture of Yerushalayim instead. Can't make my house look ugly. We just learned it in the Rambam, right? You were there when we learned the Rambam. It says you should never uh, fill your plate with every good food you could eat. Right? If you go to weddings, don't wear all your jewelry that you could wear. You know, uh, you don't, you know, if we, don't, we don't have knives at the table during benching. A Jew does not have a knife at the table when he benches. It's halacha. It's halacha. It's halacha. question is why? Because there was once a story, many years ago, in the days of the Talmud, a person came to the part that says, B'nei Yerushalayim, Hashem should build Yerushalayim. He felt so bad, he took the knife and stabbed himself and killed himself. So the Gemara said, from that day on, no one will bench with a knife on the table. So now the question, I just heard it last week, I've heard, I forgot who said it. Um, the question is, okay, great. But today, is anybody, anybody we know going to stab themselves? <laughs> Anybody. Is one Jew going to stab themselves? No. So why do we do it? So remember, there used to be Jews who did. And that's bad enough that you don't feel that way. But at least put it away. 
And on Shabbos, though, you don't cover it because Shabbos is Shabbos. Now, I guess for the guy who would want to stab himself, how could life go on without a base of Migdash? He understands. You know, life can go on? Shabbos. Okay? So even a guy who would stab himself wouldn't stab himself on Shabbos. Those are things we don't think about. You take the knife away from the table. No. <laughs> so we're not in touch with it. So what does Hashem have to do? He loves us dearly. He says, what, what, what's the Jewish people without mourning for, for their loss? He brings them other losses. He brings them other losses to know. That's what we're going to talk about tonight already. Amir Hashem, we should, uh, in the course of our learning, we should, Hashem should awaken up our hearts and we should uh, try to feel a little bit more connected and we should be Zoha to mourn for the temple and indeed to rejoice when it gets rebuilt.